Imagine a world where more women had the time to fully explore their genius. Welcome to She Rebel Radio, the UK's podcast for women leaders and founders ready to unlearn conventional rules and lead their businesses of significance. We've been held for counter status quo ideas and a whole dose of feminine perspective. This is our eighth series. My name's Lulu Mins and I host retreats and create spaces for women leaders to explore their genius. And today I'm going to create that same space right here for you on this podcast. Welcome to episode 128 of She Rebel Radio, writing for visibility with Mildred Talabi. Mildred is the author of Start Being Visible, a book which shares how to raise your profile, promote your brand and attract your ideal clients through LinkedIn. As a former journalist and PR and communications professional, Mildred has spent the last decade mastering the art of personal branding in both her career and business. Today, she specialises in helping female leaders build powerful and authentic personal brands through being visible on LinkedIn. As a recognised LinkedIn influencer, Mildred has over 50,000 followers, is a four times published author and the founder of the Visible Women Tribe, a global membership community for high achieving women in business and leadership. And most recently, Mildred launched her Start Being Visible podcast. Mildred, it's amazing to have you here. How are you doing today? I am doing good. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today, Lulu. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I'd love to start with the three reasons why every woman in her business needs to be visible and build a personal brand. And it's not just women who have businesses, right? No, it's absolutely not women. So I I, I work with female leaders and women with businesses, you know, because visibility is absolutely essential if you want to progress in your career or your business. So yes, in terms of those three reasons, I like to say that the three outcomes that happen when you start being visible on LinkedIn and beyond, number one is you're going to increase your influence. Number two, you will increase your income. And number three, you will increase your impact. More often than not, it'll be all three at the same time or you know, little segments of, of, of the three of them. But these are the things that really help you to have a fulfilling work life when you can increase your income, your impact and your influence. Amazing. Which is the one that people seem to prioritize the most? It's really interesting, actually, because I have I have some people who come to me and business people and they're like, OK, I want to I want to know how to make money from LinkedIn and find clients and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's great. But actually, I'm not the coach for you, you know, because what I like to do is I like people who want to make and increase their income and have an impact at the same time. So this is where the personal branding comes into it and the visibility, because you absolutely can get clients and all of that by using on LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, what's called getting leads. And I don't even like this terminology myself, this whole idea of leads and prospects and get loads of people's names and send them messages until someone bites and keep on doing it. You can do it that way. Yeah. You know, but th- that's not the way that I roll. <laughs> you know, it's not the way that I, I teach or advise as well. So people, so when people come, the sweet spot is when they're like, okay, I want to increase my income. Absolutely. But I also want to do, make a difference in doing so. I want to reach my audience. I want to serve my audience. I want to help them to have better lives or whatever. Now I'm like, okay, now we're talking because that's what I'm about. Build a brand and a business at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And lots of women do wear their heart on their sleeves, don't they, in terms of wanting to make that impact. But what what are the biggest fears that women face in your experience in actually showing up and being visible? Yeah, there's, there are quite a few. And one of the biggest ones is the fear of being judged, mm-hmm. you know, so it's and it, and it seems to be more more come I know that and when I when I have conversations around this I do have some men who say yeah I have some of these fears too I'm like absolutely I know but generally there's some things that we tend to struggle more with as women than men so the fear of judgment is one of them so this whole idea of before they show up um lots of women are like what will people think of me you know what would they think of my post you know I wonder they might think I'm showing up too much am I being too salesy you know I don't want them to think I'm a I'm a spammer you know my post connecting and people that are in work will be like what about my colleagues I don't want my boss to think this or so there's all this whole thing of 
what we think other people think of us that's like a big fear that a lot of women have that holds them back from from being visible on linkedin you know so yeah. and what, what, I, what i like to say is that people don't even think about you know we're close to as much as you think they do you know no. yeah they don't do that we're all concerned with ourselves for the most part yeah 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 no one cares as much as you think it but it's kind of representative isn't it of that and I do a lot of women only events and a lot of women you know say oh it's so amazing to be in a space where I don't feel judged it's that contradiction that we face as women you know of even you know from weight wise don't be fat don't be skinny too skinny mm. you know it's it's always that so it's interesting how that shows up with being visible um and you talk about in the book um thank you so much for sending me a copy about people trusting mainstream culture much less and I include myself in that and wanting these authentic brands to follow do you think we have to balance that with a fear of cancel culture um and is that a risk we risk we have to manage or do you think it's a perceived risk is it really there I I I really hate the cancel culture <laughs> on that, yeah on a personal level I really hate it because it's the way I see it we cancel people for speaking out loud what they're going to be speaking in their bedrooms anyway, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not, you're not changing the person. You're just stopping them from speaking it publicly and then it will find another outlet in a different way. So um, now, see, you've got me on a, on a tangent. Can, can I <laughs> I forgot, because <laughs> it's really something that bugs me. And I forgot what the question you asked me is in, in relation to... Just it being, you know, with, you know, your message being get out there, be visible. Like, how can we balance that with the, the fear of cancel culture and that being a real fear? As you say that, you know, we don't change the person, but people can be afraid to speak out, uh, you know, as their authentic selves or say what they're really thinking in case people hate them too much. And then that's it. All the good work they've done, you know, is 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 it a real risk mm -hmm. that we're facing, do you think? I, I think that for the vast majority of women listening to this, you're not even going to be close to that danger of council culture, you know, because what, what happens, two, re two ways that it happens. One, the higher your profile, the more you're at risk of that. So like celebrities, for example, they can't even put a foot wrong or someone's getting ready to cancel them, you know, because they have such a high profile. And with that comes a burden of, you know, responsibility or whatever else. So for most of us, we're not going to, our profile, we're not going to get to that place where we have that celebrity status where everyone's watching every word, single word that we say. So that's one. And the second thing as well is that in terms of the, the genre, so if, for example, you're on LinkedIn and you're talking about, I don't know, finance and personal finance and accounting, and that's your business, there's not that many controversial things that you can say within, <laughs> you know, yeah. within the realms of personal finance and accounting. You know, I'm yeah. happy to be proved wrong by an accountant listening, you know? Yeah, so. <laughs> that, that could be a really dodgy one and share, share like, to get themselves into trouble that way, definitely. But is yeah. it something, you know, you're not quite celebrity status, Mildred, but on LinkedIn, maybe so, 50,000 followers. Is it something you worry about or is what you're talking about is not controversial enough, as you say? So I don't, the reason I don't worry about it is because I stand, I believe part of the building an authentic personal brand is standing behind what it is that you say. So for example, and I also believe strongly that you can't build a personal brand without some personality. And this yeah. is where the the whole, uh, as you might, as you, you're saying, the whole council culture, culture fear might come into it because it's like, don't be afraid to share your personal opinions and stuff. Yeah. Now, does it mean that I should be commenting about any and everything and offering my personal opinions on anything? No, it doesn't. But in my realm, mm -hmm. so in the realm that I cover, which is business, which is visibility, which is women. And sometimes I talk about social justice as well, because that matters to me. I come out and I put posts out about that and I stand behind it. And I have had posts where people have disagreed with me. And that's absolutely fine, because guess what? You're not going to get everybody to like you and that's not even a goal that you should aim for because no one is liked by anyone by everybody you no. know so the whole point is like and one of my early business coaches said this to me she said you need to you need to be you need to be comfortable with alienating in order to resonate 
Yeah. So, which means be comfortable with alienating people who are not your target audience so that you can resonate with those who are. Mm -hmm. And that's how we build powerful personal brands. When we really strongly resonate with the people who are our audience, who want to hear from us, and those people who disagree, you don't have to counsel them. If someone says something negative on my post, you know, I can go, I can reply with a comment. I don't have to block them unless they're just there to just be rude and horrible and trolling and you've got nothing better to do in life than to go and do that on people's posts but if they genuinely have a disagreement from what I said I can engage in a conversation with you and we can both leave that conversation still agreeing on different things and that's okay and with personality you talk about you know um we need to have a personality you know and get out there and be visible do you find because you like me work with women who run their own businesses or women in leadership find that women in leadership rather than in their own business struggle to find or or trust that they can be safe with that personality more than say someone who's running their own business and doing their own thing absolutely absolutely because again it goes back to that judgment thing of Oh, what will my, even, I find even when they're high in senior leadership and they don't necessarily have, they, they have a direct report, they have bosses, et cetera, but they have freedom to do what they want. But there's also this whole thing of what will people think? So yeah. they're not a lot more calculated about how they are visible, especially in the beginning stages until they get more comfortable. With it. And it's understandable because when you run your own business, it's your brand. Yeah. You know, it's you that you're promoting. So I can say something silly, but that comes back to Mildred. But when you are, you know, when you're a senior leader in an organization, now it's not low. Even if you say these views are my own, it's still going to come back to your company in some way. And there's that fear that people have of, am I representing my company in a way that, you know, that 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 is not negative? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. It is something that female leaders struggle more with than women in business, but it can be overcome. And I and I talk about this whole idea of employee influences in terms of the as an employee, you've actually got more influence using your personal brand in that organization than the corporate brand does. You yeah. know, so your personal brand posting things about your job or whatever it is that's useful can have more of an impact in. In, in on the company brand in a good way than all the communication crafted posts that they send on a corporate page that no one likes anyway. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And as you say, you're representing the organization and possibly your mm -hmm. industry as well, but more and more people are following individuals, aren't they? Rather yes. than organizations and, and we can have more power by moving around and doing that as well. So thank you for sharing. Now uh, with LinkedIn, uh, in effect, we're talking about social selling um, on LinkedIn. You've created four pillars um, for successful social selling on, on the platform. Um, what um, Can you share with us what that is? Um, for those that don't know what social selling is, what that is and what your four pillars are. Sure. So social selling is this whole idea of so traditional selling marketing is it was kind of very much cold sales where you're beating people around the head with your message and trying to force them to buy. So this is where the cold DMs comes from. If you've been on LinkedIn, even for a minute, you probably got like somebody message you out of the blue to say, hey, you know, would you like to buy this service or would you like to jump on a call to talk about whatever the business is that you have zero interest in, but They've got your name from, you know, the list of contacts and they just send in messages out there. Now, social social selling is a different thing. This is where you sell essentially via relationships and social media content. So this is where in your post and in the things that you put out, you're building this whole factor of what's called the know me, like me, trust me factor. Yeah. So and how it relates to the four pillars. So those four pillars of LinkedIn success are your profile your content, audience, and engagement. So profile, content, audience, and engagement. Mm -hmm. So when you have all of these four things in place and they're pillars because they're all equally important, having a good profile, putting out content, you know, knowing who your audience is and finding a way to connect with them and then engaging with other people on the platform, that sets you up to do social selling really well because as you put out content that's helpful to your audience, 
and you engage with your audience in conversations, you know, whether it's on your posts or in DMs, people will start to know, like, and trust you. And when they happen, when that happens, they buy into you. And when people buy into you, who you are, it's so much easier for them to buy from you when you're it, when you're in business or even if you're not selling anything we sell ideas you know we sell yeah. certain thoughts etc we sell a vision we sell a mission people will buy that into that so much more when they're bought into who you are and that's how building a personal brand and doing social selling makes that job a whole lot easier and actually I think a lot more enjoyable than sending people cold direct messages that they don't want yeah definitely and your four pillars are like a table you need all four of them to hold it up yes. <laughs> as it were <laughs> and as as you started with profile there I asked you before the interview to check my profile out vulnerable share everybody <laughs> um and asked you to tell me what's the best and the worst thing about it and to the audience this is the first time I've heard it as well <laughs> Luli it was the worst profile I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> Love it. (laughs) (laughs) My heart took a leap. (laughs) No, I've seen a lot of profiles in many, many years. So yours was really, really good. You actually got a really good profile, which speaks directly to your target audience in terms of it's clear who your target is. Women is women of a certain age. It's like you've got the radio, everything around what you put out on your profile speaks to your audience and that's exactly what a profile should do you know people mistake the profile sometimes especially the about section to be about them so they'll go on and on about how they got these credentials they got this they got that and it's like okay great but as your potential target audience I don't see myself in that you know so yours doesn't do that you really do it well in terms of everything from the top to bottom Um, really speaks to and of your audience which is excellent my only slight improvement with your banner which had a lovely picture of women with hands raised I would (laughs) love some words on there in terms of okay who are these exciting women with their hands raised and is it something I can join in you know so yeah that would be my only very minor suggestion on the profile but you Brilliant. scored very highly apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> woo, woo, gold stars for me. And you know what? When I thought, oh, I'm going to ask this um, and hope hope that she won't rip it apart, I did think, oh, I don't think Mildred's going to like the banner. <laughs> <laughs> but have I changed it? No, I thought it's not fair for me to then start fiddling with it before I ask you to have a look at it. So <laughs> thank you and take that advice um, to those ladies listening um, to, you know, check it out and, you know, check out Mildred's profile um, and have a good look. So... Um, and you talk about content so and and the 80 20 rule which I love the 80 20 rule in so many ways for so many different things what's your advice here and and what else do we need to know about our content that we share on LinkedIn yeah so so the 80 20 rule so I talk about this there's three main types of content that you will find yourself sharing on LinkedIn especially if you are in business so it's professional content promotional content and personal content if you're not in business the promotional one probably won't apply as much so professional content is content that's going to be the vast majority of content that you share that's your 80 percent so this is the content that speaks to what you do as a professional this is the content where you're serving your audience with things that are useful for useful and helpful in their journey to whatever the transformation is that you you do for them so that will be the the 80%. That's the content that you post most of the time. Now, the other 20%, you can split between promotional and personal. So promotional content for a business person is where you're directly asking for the sale. You know, again, a lot of times, a lot of the business women that I work with, because I essentially do business coaching as well as LinkedIn um, mm-hmm. visibility coaching. It's like they have a fear of selling, yeah. you know? And it's like, well, if you don't sell, (laughs) you know, if you don't make offers, no one's going to know that you've got stuff to be sold. So, and actually as a a little side, side rabbit hole place thing, there's a book that I read, which is absolutely um, excellent and changing will help to change my mindset about selling. And that's called Go Give Us Sell More, you know, and that's Uh by Bob Berg and another guy, John David something. But is this whole idea, this idea that selling is serving, Mm. you know, selling is not something that you do to people, it's something that you do for people. 
you know, and when you really get that into your mind that when you sell, you're serving your audience, you're giving them the chance to buy into your service or product product or program, whatever it is that's going to transform their life. Now, that makes a difference to how you approach things. So that's what the promotional post is about. Every now, every now and again, you just kind of directly ask for the sell. Hey, I've got this program. Hey, yeah. you know, if you want to talk to him about coaching, get in touch, you know, whatever it is. And then the last part is the personal content. So as I already mentioned, it's you can't build a personal brand without personality. And part of personality is people getting to know who you are outside of the professional arena. So we don't want business, business, business all the time. It's like, okay, what do you do for fun, Lulu? You know, what do you, you know, what did you get up to over the weekend? What's your family situation like? What books inspire you? So things that give people an insight into who you are as a person. It's yeah. part of that whole whole rounded thing of building a personal brand that's successful on LinkedIn and beyond. Yeah, hundred percent. And I know my audience always uh, they they know that a I love yoga and b um I'm uh, whenever I'm local people think I'm in Cornwall because I'm down in Cornwall a lot as well. They know <laughs> I love beaches down in Cornwall, so they're like, oh, you're here. And I'm like, I am here most of the time, definitely. <laughs> and can you repeat the book for us again? What what was it called? Just so the audience can catch that. It's called Go Givers, Sell More. Go and, Givers, Sell More. Nice. Yeah, Go yeah. Givers. And, and it's, it's part two of a, the original book. It's called Go Givers. And then this one, oh, The Go Giver. And it's all about giving and how that moves you forward in life. And then this one is specifically about how Go Givers sell, you know. And it's, yeah, yeah Bob Berg uh, is the name of the guy. Yeah. And when you're, you know, in service, it, I think that flip is really powerful. And I read, and I can't remember which book it was years ago saying it's almost like going to a restaurant and they don't offer you dessert if you, you know, <laughs> if yes. you're not telling people how they can work with you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you've got to offer that dessert because we want it more times than not, you know, it's yeah. in fact, in fact, dessert is one of the things, one of those things that you want it, but you don't want to ask for it sometimes because it's like, well, I don't need to have it. So when someone offers it, it gives you permission to have it and eat it and enjoy it. So, yeah, yeah 100%, 100%. <laughs> we want the pudding. So um, you talk about visibility with audience and, and we have on LinkedIn connections and followers. What's the difference between the two? And should we approach our followers and our connections differently? So the biggest difference is over the last, I would say maybe a couple of years, even a bit less than that, LinkedIn has been really shifting to be creator focused. So what that means, so all the other platforms have been calling the people who post content on their stuff creators for quite a while. LinkedIn is only catching up. So now they're using the term creators and creator mode. They have creator managers to manage, um, you know, so I have a creator manager who, you know, supposed to help me, you know, do even better on LinkedIn. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. technically their job, you know. But so in as part of that shift to really kind of recognize that the platform is a platform that welcomes creators, people who produce content, they, they've made it the default that it's now follow is what people do rather than connect. Yeah. Before it used to be connect. So connect means that someone when they click the connect button they ask you to request to be in your network you yeah. know so in order for them to be in your network you have got to accept at your end and once you accept they become a connection and now you two can have a two-way communication mm -hmm. followers is a one-way street so followers people don't have to request to follow you they just click follow in the same way as they do on instagram or you know not facebook because they request but instagram you follow if you yeah. see someone you like, you follow it. The same way with LinkedIn. If you like them, you click the follow button. And what that means is that their content can now show up on your feed. But yeah. they will, they might not have any clue that you follow them because I've got, I don't know, I've got about 10, 11,000 connections but about 50,000 plus followers. So I don't know who most of them are, but there are people who have subscribed to my content. So essentially the following allows people to subscribe to your content and it's a way for you to actually grow more on the platform because now it's no longer this gated, um, this gated pathway of someone has to request a connection. You have to check them out, see, see if you want yeah. to connect and all of that. So yeah, if, I wouldn't, 
I would say actively reach out to people that you want in your network as mm -hmm. connections. So if you see somebody and you say, yeah, I think I'd love to be able to communicate with this person, actively reach out and connect with them. If it's someone you just like their content and you want to see more of it on your feed, then the follow is button is absolutely fine in those scenar scenarios. Yeah. And if people are following you and you want to connect with them because they might be interested in, in, in new business wise, is that a good thing to do or? Yeah, I actually have, um, I actually regularly go through, well, I get my VA supports with this to go through my following list and see if there's anybody who's interested in there, who's in my, in my target audience. And then she reaches out to them and says, hey, you know, I'm good to see you following. Do you want to connect instead? And nine times out of 10, they do. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely a good thing to keep an eye on on a regular basis. Yeah, and then we get the, I'm not sure why that person's following me. Maybe for the wrong reasons, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's plenty, plenty of them. I get like retired builder in <laughs> Carolina. I'm like, uh, okay, but all right. <laughs> he wants to know all about his LinkedIn, obviously, and how he can create an audience. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And what's happening with LinkedIn Live these days? Can anyone get access or? Is it still quite restricted? Oh, they've, they've opened it all out over the last few years. So LinkedIn Live is, allows you to broadcast live on a platform. And yet yeah, anyone could get access now. The only requirement that they have is that you activate creator mode. So this is just a feature that swaps your profile from the old version where connect is the main default to one where it's follow is the main default and you can have hashtags under your name and all of that, which represent the topics that you talk about. So once you activate creator mode, and I think there's a minimum criteria of like, you have to have, I think it's about 200 connections. I can't remember exactly what it was, but just some kind of, it's very, 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 very low entry level. Okay. Then you've got access to LinkedIn live. And I would highly recommend the use of LinkedIn live. I love LinkedIn live and it's been a real, asset in growing my brand and my business on LinkedIn yeah amazing I must I, I love I've used Facebook live for years so I must jump on that I think I thought I still didn't have access to it so that's that's good to know yeah no you should you should you you're way over the criteria for it so you definitely should have access happy days happy days yeah and I love a live because I can't be bothered with fiddling around and editing and stuff that's not my <laughs> I'm just like uh, I used to be a litigator so it's like it is as it is right um yes. there's no going back and changing it but um so talking about that engagement LinkedIn live's a great way to engage what are other ways that we can engage on LinkedIn yeah so en engagement is, is really important it's like the other side of the coin with content so content is like, without content, you're invisible. Without posting your own original content on LinkedIn, you're pretty much invisible. But engagement also lends itself to visibility when you're engaging strategically. And by this, I mean comments. You yeah. know, it's just commenting on other people's, pro, other people's posts, other people's content is going to do really well for you for visibility, but also for building those all important relationships on LinkedIn and building a community. Now, when it comes to comments, it's not great post, nice, thanks for sharing, you know, all of those kind of things. Those are not meaningful comments. I talk about leaving meaningful comments. So for example, often on my posts, I would ask a question. A meaningful comment would be answering the question, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> yeah, I, that is as simple as that. Or if you see a post that you like, and instead of just clicking like and moving on, take a few seconds to write in the comments why you like that post. Maybe mm -hmm. something that they put there spoke to you. Put that in the comments because one, that's good. Even if like the original person who posted it doesn't get around to see your post, other people who are also to see your comment, I mean, other people on there will see your comment. And sometimes that can raise, if you put a meaningful comment in the right place, that can gain you visibility from your target audience. So they will go and check out your profile, which must be good because remember, it's part of the four pillars. And they'll say, hey, you know, Lulu made this comment. I wonder what else Lulu does. Check out your profile. Oh, Lulu's into supporting and championing women. That sounds like someone I want to follow. Hit the mm -hmm. follow. There you go. You've got another follower. You're increasing your audience, your visibility, and it's good times from there. Happy days. Happy days. <laughs>
Brilliant. Thank you very much. And how you are the author of four books. How does writing a book help us become visible? And what are your top tips here? First of all, writing a book will not make you a millionaire. <laughs> Let's just get that no, out of here. really? <laughs> <laughs> so don't chase the income when writing a book. Do not, unless you're JK Rowling, you know, you better think of your book as a marketing tool, a big fat giant business card. Yeah. You know? One that also serves people, which is which is great. And I'm and it always touches me when people send me reader comments about my book and how it's helped them. You know, I absolutely love that. So um, how does book help with visibility? Book it helps with your credibility as an expert. So if you can put it down in a book, you know a thing or two about that topic. You yeah. know, so it absolutely helps with the credibility as an expert. It helps with the visibility. Now, not everyone is going to be able to access or see you. You know, so my book has ended up in countries that I will probably never visit in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. you know but they but my book can get there and that's the power of a good book it also gives people access to you you know where they may not be able to so some people can't you know they can't afford my coaching services one-to-one -one, but they can pick up my book for like less than 20 pounds on amazon and that yeah. can help them get started on the journey to be invisible so it opens up more ways that people can benefit from the the knowledge and expertise that you have and also, last but not least, speaking engagements, things like that. When you have a book, that is a really good way to kind of for people to one, know the topics that you speak about, and two, to get invitations to speak. So I speak about being visible. I speak about building your personal brand and LinkedIn and having a book helps to open doors to some of those opportunities um, as well. Yeah, amazing. Opening those doors and also giving structure to the things that you do know as well, because you've got to structure a book, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've got to get it out of your head onto paper in a way that other people can understand. So, yeah, definitely. Perfect. What is next for you, Mildred? And where can we find you? So I, I launched my podcast earlier this month, Start Being Invisible, and that's my little passion project at the moment because I'm all about raising the visibility of women in every industry. So Start Being Invisible is a weekly podcast which comes out every Wednesday. So please, please, please subscribe to that. You can find it on all of your favorite podcast platforms as well as on LinkedIn Live and YouTube. And um, yeah, if you want to find me, connect with me. I pretty much live on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say to the audience, they know where to find you. <laughs> yes, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, but you can also go to my website, startbeinvisible.com for more resources and things to get you started on your own journey to be invisible. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mildred. It's been awesome to have you. Thank you, Lulu. Thanks for having me on here. Thank you for listening to She Rebel Radio. If this episode has inspired you, please pass it on and share with at least one other incredible woman. Don't forget to also hit subscribe and leave us a review. You can find out more about me and my work at lulumins.com or on most social media platforms.